So uh, I'm actually very excited um, in lieu of actually being in Omaha today uh, to be joined by Chris Bloomstrand, who I've seen there for many years. Uh, we've been communicating about Berkshire Hathaway, one of our favorite subjects, obviously. Um, I'm delighted to have him here for everyone. Uh, in addition to being a great investor, Chris is a very insightful uh, analyst as it comes to Berkshire Hathaway, and I think pretty unique in his approach and, and introspective uh, and detail of the conglomerate. So to give you a little background, Chris is president and chief investment officer at Separ Augustus Investment Group. Chris has over 29 years of professional experience with a value-driven approach to fundamental equity and industry research. Semper Augustus manages concentrated all-cap portfolios with typically long holding periods and a general benchmark. Chris received his Bachelor of Science in Finance from the University of Colorado at Boulder. He also played football there. He serves as the president of the board of directors for the CF Society in St. Louis and has been a director on the board since 2001. Chris writes extensively about Berkshire Hathaway and more broadly on thematical topics related to the stock market and the economy. His annual year-end letter is widely read among the value investing community. He very much enjoys giving back mentorship and loves speaking regularly at many colleges and universities. Most recently, he was honored to speak at Columbia Business School's Hybron Center for Graham and Dot Investing. I am really delighted to have Chris here today to talk about Berkshire Hathaway and please welcome Chris. Hey, Matt, good to see you. It's great that you guys put this thing together. It's very unusual not being in Omaha on the first it, Saturday in May. Uh, it, why don't you show us your badge uh, just to yeah. feel a little familiar with the, uh, with the event? Th this was going to be my 20th meeting. We bought the stock for the first time in February 2000, so I found my April uh, 29, 2000 badge. Uh, I missed 2001 when my first child, my daughter, was born. She's now 19 years old. Haven't missed a meeting since. Uh, anyhow, it's it's uh, already looking forward to May May 1 of 2021. Well, I hope to see you there. All right, so Chris, let's get started. Uh, before we talk about your high-level thoughts on the conglomerate, maybe we could just react to the the queue this morning. Um, get your sense of you know what what came out of that, and then secondarily, if you could just jump to what you expect Warren to talk about at the Q and A today at 4:45 in terms of the outlook for the conglomerate and you know potential capital allocation signals that you would look for. I, mean, I think I and you and anybody that follows Berkshire even from afar, given the magnitude of the crisis underway and the degree to which we think the stock is undervalued. You know, we very much expected to see a lot more share repurchases. Um, $1.7 billion was underwhelming, but I had thought, given the increased volumes during the, the quarter, certainly in March, that the company could have, could have bought, you know, upwards of one year's worth of free cash, so north of $20 billion. Um, they did very little net buying in the stock market, $1.8 billion. If you got into the further footnotes, the statement of financial position, you may have seen that getting into April after quarter end, they sold uh, $6.1 billion. So I presume that reflects that the airline positions are probably gone, you know, maybe some other holdings. They may have trimmed GM, who knows, but I think the airlines are gone. Um, you know, my sense is if you looked and, and you saw it in the, in, the, in the back of the, you, know, you saw it in the footnotes, um, all of the share repurchases took place prior to really the crisis getting underway. So they stopped buying on March 10 and bought shares back at higher prices, considerably higher prices than which they had bought back the $5 billion last year. So to see only $1.7 billion, given the enormity of the cash position on the balance sheet was surprising. And, I, and I'm certain he'll address that. I think, you know, with, with Bill Gates leaving the board and resigning from the Microsoft board, you know, that, that tells me that, you know, I think the driver of, of this, this conservatism in the downturn is probably, uh, you know, I, I think they're concerned. This, is, this thing could be far uh, worse than, you know, they would have thought in March. And I think, you know, sitting on those resources probably makes some sense there. But, you know, I, I think, you know, we find the shares, as I know you do too, uh, considerably undervalued. And, you know, given how long these cash reserves have been building to not see them put to work is, 
you know, frankly, a little disappointing. Yeah, I, I do. Um, if you look at the the Q, the, it looks like the share counts decreased. Uh, almost 5 million shares of the Bs, 3,000 shares of the A. So I, I think there was a continuation um, post-March into April uh, on share buybacks, but as you say, on a run rate that would be a little less than exciting. Uh, okay, so now let's let's talk about why we're here today and, and, and really kind of highlight your background and, and your skill set around the valuation of the conglomerate. You know, in the past, Warren's used book value as a typical benchmark uh, metric for valuing the firm. But a couple of years ago, he referred to uh, the four groves and, and thinking about some of the parts valuation. And I think you've been a big advocate of going over the sum of the parts as being kind of the most reasonable and smart way to value the conglomerate. So maybe you could just talk about why that, is, that approach you think is best, uh, why is that is consistent with uh, Warren as well. Well, let me let me let me start the start that by suggesting that I think book value, despite this de-emphasis in the last couple of years, is still immensely important at Berkshire Hathaway. You think about about the sum of the parts and and where the equity capital of the business is. I mean, you know, the insurance operation is still forty five, you know, north of forty five percent of the operation. You know, statutory capital, uh, you know, at year end was over 200 billion. It's probably, you know, 190 ish billion today, given the recovery in stocks since the end of March. Um, book value is incredibly important in, in, a, in a property casualty insurance and reinsurance operation. You've got between the railroad and uh, the energy businesses, that's another 80 or so billion dollars in equity. So there you've got, you know, three quarters of the book value of the business or in businesses where, where book value is important. You think about the energy business, you earn a regulated return on equity. You know, they earn you know, roughly 10 as we do the math and make some of the accounting adjustments. And so, uh, you know, and then the, the, the balance of the value of the business are the, the manufacturing service and retail businesses, which we struggle with. You know, we think capital allocation has been an issue there. They've bought some things at control premium prices that really has disallowed decent economic returns. But there you've got, you know, you know, book value of, uh, of, of the balance. I mean, it's, uh, you know, business does about $150 billion in revenues. They earn, uh, uh, you know, maybe seven and a half on equity is all, which is starting to stretch the limits of, of where we find the business attractive. Um, but, you know, it's a business that has two thirds of the book value, the MSR group now, in goodwill and other intangibles. And so, you know, Mr. Buffett would have you believe and tell you over the years that returns on net tangible capital or, or, or what drives the bus. And I'd say that's true, except that in this business, uh, most of the profits of that group seem to be upstream to the parent. And I would contend that if, if you have the ability to reinvest in a business that had a 20 plus return on equity, um, then you know I can dismiss the goodwill and intangibles. But if you don't have reinvestment opportunity, don't, don't tell me that that business, you know, the, you know, the, the goodwill that you paid shouldn't be taken into, cons into consideration when, when assessing the profitability. But, but I think more to your point, the general you know, approach of uh, some of the parts really does make sense. You, know, you go back to the early 2000s, maybe 2003, Mr. Buffett laid out in his chairman's letter, you know, these, you know, the, the regulated utility business, which then included the railroad. You know, I think that group can stand alone. You know, we still have the luxury as analysts of having separate SEC filings posted by both uh, Berkshire Hathaway Energy and by the railroad. And so you get a lot of granular data there. Uh, but then you get to, uh, you know, he, 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 for years and years, we had the separate leasing businesses, the finance and financial products. Well, those have now been rolled up into this giant manufacturing service retail group, which as I said, does about $150 billion in revenues, earns, you know, say an 8% profit margin. Um, you know, it, it's a big driver of value. You know, we think, that MSR group is probably worth, you know, on the order of 170, 180 billion dollars, a slight premium to one-time sales. Go back to the railroad, you know, the rail, you know, we think is conservatively valued at 100 billion dollars. They paid mid 30 billion dollars for it. I think 37 billion dollars. An incredible buy in 2009. We thought it was a mistake at the outcome, you know, at the outset, and have, have very quickly changed our minds when we realized that the economics of that business had improved versus where they'd been historically. And then the energy business, you know, a very predictable regulated return, uh, 
you know, business that will do about 10 on equity is worth somewhere north of $50 billion, $55 billion. So you look at those groves, as Mr. Buffett calls it, in the sum of the parts, and that works. We, we, we have another method which reconciles really the earning power of the business against some big moving parts and, and, and accounting adjustments to the, the publish gap financials that we make. And we think, you know, over the years, we've kind of learned that there's been some hidden value inside the published numbers. Uh, you know, I think the lay investor that pulls out the queue today or reads the annual report, you know, if you simply start with the consolidated financial statements to, to try to get a sense of the profitability of the business, you wouldn't have a clue. There, there are just too many nuances to the way the accounting works in the business that distort the underlying profitability. So all of these methods that, that we use are really in an attempt to reconcile against each other, um, to try to determine you know, what we think is the, the core raw earning power on a normalized basis. So with an effort to smooth out a lot of the volatility that comes with stock prices bouncing around from quarter to quarter or underwriting profitability bouncing around. So I'm trying to get, so if you said to me, Chris, at year end, what do you think Berkshire's worth? I'd give you a number. Uh, you know, I think the business is worth you know, somewhere north of, you know, 730, $740 billion. Well, today, you know, we may be shaving our, our assessment of the value based on what we think could be a much longer duration of this economic downturn. But in a normal world outside of this crisis, I wouldn't give you much of a different number. You know, we think the business earns 10 on equity durably. We think it's earned that on for the last 20 years. And so I've got a method that essentially says, you know, Berkshire's core earning power today is somewhere you know around forty billion dollars, and on that, on you know book value that's today marked to market, uh, you know given Friday's close in the stocks, probably three hundred ninety billion dollars. It's a business that earns about ten on equity, and so yeah, to to me you to me you've got to smooth and you've got to normalize to get to a, a proper assessment of value. That's great, thank you. So you touched briefly on the energy and the, the rails, but maybe we could delve into the uh, insurance business, which is certainly the crown jewel, as you mentioned. Can you talk about how rare it is for an insurance company to have a history of underwriting profit? And what does that mean in, in terms of valuing the float um, and whether it's misclassified as a liability in a gap accounting? Well, it's a huge advantage. If you look at the history of, you know, the broad industry of property casualty insurance and, and the reinsurance businesses globally, very few very few durably underwrite profitably. You know, I think, you know, the history of property casualty uh, sees the industry right at a 1% underwriting loss. Well, Berkshire has a very long history back to 1967 of, as everybody knows, walking away from business when it's mispriced. Um, you know, I think, you know, writing intelligently, you, you don't see massive uh, reserve, adverse reserve development across those businesses. And so, with that, you've got this long history of a business that's produced, you know, slightly positive underwriting results in today's environment with zero interest rates, which appears, you know, to perhaps be the case for the foreseeable future. You better underwrite profitably because you don't have any room for error. You know, back in the 1970s and early 80s, when interest rates were sky high, you could underwrite at a 5% loss and make up the difference with higher yields on fixed income securities. But, you know, if you, know, if you look at the progression of, of the capital inside the, the aggregate of Berkshire Hathaway's insurance businesses. I mean, you've got almost $200 billion in equity capital. It was $230 billion at year end. If you think about how the different lines of insurance are written and determine how much capital is required to write, to simply write in those lines, start with Geico that does, um, you know, half of Berkshire's uh, insurance premiums, a little more than half, so a little over $30 billion. Well, in, in auto insurance, which is written on an admitted basis, you write, you know, with the insurance commissioner's blessings in each of the states that you're doing business in, um, you know, you, you, you're allowed to write from a statutory standpoint, $3 a premium for every dollar of capital. We've always assumed that Berkshire writes closer to two to one, but you think about the capital required then. So if you're going to write 30 plus billion, you've got to have $15 billion in capital. You know, I think the business is probably overcapitalized there to an extent, but that's, that's auto, that, that's half the insurance book. So if you take, you know, the rest of the statutory capital or even the gap capital of the insurance businesses, that's still 200, almost $200 billion. On the balance of the $30 billion written, find another insurance company or reinsurance company that writes 
$30 billion in premiums on $200 billion in capital. Nobody, I mean, there, it's just, it tells you that there's massive, massive overcapitalization in the business that's not required to fund the 37 or $38 billion in kind of normalized annual losses that go out the door. And so for that, the long history of Berkshire is one of being able to invest much more of its invested assets, the float of the business in common stocks, longer duration assets. Most insurance companies have to invest in bonds and short securities because you'll have periods where losses develop badly, where you've misstated or misunderstood or you know, misestimated what your losses will wind up being. And, and for that, the, the admitted uh, uh, side of the business requires a larger fixed income and cash book. You know, if you're writing in reinsurance, if you're writing in specialty business that's not as regulated or not regulated except for you know, the fact that you need uh, you know, credit ratings, uh, uh, it, not so much of an issue. Um, and so you know, Berkshire is just this massive overcapitalized thing that allows that stock portfolio. So when you talk about float, I think the question I've gotten more and more over the years is, well, Chris, you, you're essentially saying the value of the insurance operation is essentially the value of the invested assets. Why aren't you backing off a liability for the float that sits on, on you know, mostly sits on the right side of the balance sheet? And for that, you know, you've heard Mr. Buffett, Mr. Munger talk, and I think they're right. If you were to break up the business and run off the insurance operations, then that, then that net liability that sits there to pay the losses that develop in insurance is absolutely a liability and you would pay it out the door. But if Geico has the ability to grow and the specialty business has the ability to grow, and if, if National Indemnity, Gen Re have the ability to grow their premium volume over time, then to the extent Berkshire never has to dip into its pocket out of that surplus capital, it can maintain much higher invested position. And I look at the dividends that are earned from the common stock portfolio, the retained earnings of the investees, the income and interest that's earned on, on the small portion of bonds and then the cash that the business has is really the earning power of the business plus you know, we normalize underwriting profitability to about a pre-tax 5%. So, you know, in our, in our accounting adjustments, we'll take whatever underwriting profits are for the quarter or for the year, and we'll just remove them and assume a 5% pre-tax underwriting margin, which, you know, seems to be the right number over time. If you wanted to be more conservative and assume that the entirety of Berkshire's insurance operation would write at break even, then take that 5% margin on $37 billion in premium out and don't count it and just count effectively the, the investments on, on, on the investment portfolio. But I, I, I've never seen Berkshire have to liquidate the common stock portfolio to meet losses. You can go back to 2008 when the common stock portfolio fell from $80 billion to in the high 30s. I mean, the stocks dropped dollar for dollar with the S&P 500, which was down 65%, and Berkshire remained in a net massive overcapitalized position. So it's just a different animal in the insurance world. And it really boils down to that surplus capital that lets us believe that what is, you know, from an accounting standpoint, a true liability, it really is to us, you know, equity, you know, equity capital. So just to move the discussion a little bit more forward in, in terms of equity capital, because I think it's important today. I think part of the discussion is what is the ultimate outcome going to be on the insurance businesses from COVID-19 and the health crisis. And, you know, part of the, the effects have been some positives at Geico, which we've seen the, the rebates, two and a half billion to go back to um, the clients. But then there's some concern uh, on the workers' comp side, uh, event cancellation insurance, and, and potentially other aspects that may filter out. Maybe you could talk a little bit about in terms of what you've done on the research side that truly understand what the potential total implications could be to Berkshire going forward. And we did get a glimpse of that in some of the reporting this morning on the queue in terms of kind of giving us an outlook that there's going to be higher litigation as well. So maybe you could just give us your thoughts on you know, kind of the, the, the negative potential aspects to the insurance business. And then also, you know, what does this mean in terms of underwriting going forward uh, for businesses and, and sovereigns that may look to include pandemic insurance going forward? Yeah, we've done naturally. I mean, Berkshire is a very big position for us in terms of concentration of capital. And so that's the first thing we did when this crisis evolved was really dug in and talked to everybody we could, brokers and C CEOs of you know, various publicly traded companies, 
Uh, we, we've leaned on all of our resources in the industry to get comfortable with the, the obvious risks and you hit on business interruption and, and event cancellation. I think in any economic downturn, um, you mentioned workers' comp. Well, that'll be an issue, uh, you know, to the extent we have sustained periods of unemployment. Uh, you, you'll have claims there. DNO insurance tends to see a lot more claims. You know, you've seen travelers and Chubb and some of the ones that have already reported talk about, you know, having to reserve a little more there and not quite knowing what the, you know, the tail was going to be. The biggie, you know, the 800-pound gorilla in the room, and you're starting to see it in the newspapers, and we jumped on it very early was business interruption, which you know, we've always known to be a property claim. Um, you've seen some lawsuits filed by manufacturers and some restaurants uh, to suggest that a virus can introduce a property claim. Well, if you're a restaurant and you know, you've got an employee or two that wind up with, with the virus and you've got to close, the counter to that is, well, A, this is not a property claim, and B, if it is a property claim, then our liability extends to the duration of time that the business would be closed that would allow you to clean it. It's not a pandemic cover. You know, the, the industry learned its lesson after SARS. And so between business interruption and between event cancellation, you typically have exclusions and policies. And, you know, it's, it's pretty clear most of these policies are excluded. Now, in, in event cancellation, um, you know, post-SARS, you actually have to buy a separate rider uh, to cover a pandemic. And it's very expensive, as, as you're seeing. I mean, the toll on society is just gargantuan today. Very few have bought that rider. I mean, it's on the order of 10%. You know, we did a lot of work on each of the big sports leagues, um, you know, the NFL, NHL, Major League Baseball, NC2A, we lost March Madness, Formula One abroad. There are a couple of biggies that, that had, have for years, the risk committees on, on the boards at Wimbledon and the British Open, the RNA. They bought the coverage and they've paid the premium. And so you, you all have some losses there, but we, we got really comfortable uh, early on in the crisis that, that, that we don't think this is gonna be a catastrophic uh, cost to the industry. Now, you know, on the flip side of that, you've got politicians railing and saying, well, the property casualty insurance and reinsurance industries ought to bear their fair share. And we ought to re effectively rewrite these policies that have been in place. Well, that's crazy. I mean, you know, we've got rule of law. so. I think it's entirely possible that some wackadoo judge who with no doubt is a trial lawyer in a previous life will entertain a case, will fine for a plaintiff, will award a gazillion dollars in damages, and you'll have appeal after appeal after appeal. And ultimately there's a decent chance that we test the constitution and the rule of law and this thing winds up on the court step of the Supreme Court. Unfortunately, I think you've got a Supreme Court in place today that on balance, respects the rule of law. So you'll have some panic moments, I think, as the crisis evolves and you'll have some lawsuits, but at the end of the day, unless we're genuinely gonna rewrite the rule of law and rewrite a contract, I don't think it's a risk. So going forward, if you think about premium volumes, um, surely a heck of a lot more people are gonna buy uh, event cancellation insurance uh, to cover you know, any kind of stoppage like this they'll come with a high enough premium to cover the losses. But really, if you think about the cost of society broadly, the degree to which GDP has declined and the degree to which unemployment here and abroad have risen, there's really not enough capital in the property casualty insurance markets. You know, they, broadly, the, it, the industry has on the order of $800 billion in capital. It's not enough. I mean, the Fed ginned up, you know, or the Treasury ginned up, uh, you know, two plus trillion dollars, levered it up through the Federal Reserve, the insurance industry does not have the capital. So you probably wind up some kind of a public private partnership, not unlike what you have in the Southeast in Florida uh, with hurricane covers, you have the California earthquake authority. So you'll, you'll have some taxpayer and some state involvement, I think ultimately when we kind of start writing policy coverages going forward. But I'd be curious if you guys have the same take, but you know, we, we don't think there's an immediate risk, but, it, it, it's it's a game changer in terms of how we cover these risks prospectively. That's great. I mean, at, at the very least, I think the insurance companies will be tied up in court for a while, and that will be costly. Um, so, unfortunately, one derivative to the aspects that are occurring today. Chris, we, we just want to uh, finish up here, and maybe I'll just give you one more minute to comment. In a world without Warren, 
you know, how do you see that affecting your intrinsic value today and the outlook for returns going forward? Well, I would say, you know, if you, if you get into the nuances of our letter, we've been frustrated with some of the capital allocation of late. Um, we've been frustrated with some of what has been stupendous disclosure, you know, the supplementals in, in the, the chairman's letter for manufacturing service retail, where you got some of the granular data that allowed us as analysts to determine the return on equity capital. Well, now we, we, can't, we can't determine the equity capital of the business. But, you know, the counter argument to that is, look, this is a huge conglomerate. You started by saying we're going to talk about a conglomerate. There are a lot of moving parts. Um, and Mr. Buffett has properly said, you know, don't get stuck in the weeds you know, try to keep this thing at a high level and, and do what we do, which is try to drill down to the, the durable economic earning power of this, of this business. An investor coming in today should have no expectation of earning returns that the business has seen for the last 56 or 57 years. I mean, gone are the 20 plus percents. To us, though, this, this is a durable 10 on equity. Uh, I think there are, and, and you heard Charlie's comments earlier this week or a couple of weeks ago in the Wall Street Journal. You know, we're going to come out of this crisis and probably close some businesses. There are no doubt some businesses inside the MSR group that don't earn sufficient returns on an unleveraged basis, that businesses that would probably be, be, be better off in the hands of private equity, which has been anathema, you know, generally in the history of Berkshire. But there are some opportunities for the next set of, of managers of the business, I think, to move some of these assets on and off the balance sheet. You know, you go back to... Um, you know, a transdime type model with Henry Singleton. I don't think we need to be that active with Berkshire Hathaway. There are still genuinely some phenomenal assets and businesses in, in, in the fold. And a lot of the business is predictable. Um, you know, I paint as a worst case scenario, the return on, on unlevered equity capital declining from 10 to eight over the next decade. Well, if it becomes an eight, you know, that gets down to where it's not that interesting to us as investors. But again, it's an unlevered eight with no bad accounting, no history of write-offs and write-downs. Not a lot of BS. And at eight, you know, it's worth maybe 120% above. So, you know, not, not far from where it's trading today, you know, worth a little bit more. But if it earns 10 sustainably, uh, then the stock price is worth, you know, a lot more than the current bid. The stock's trading at 65 cents on the dollar of fair value if, if, if our base assessment is right. And this is a 10, RO, an unlevered 10 ROE. Great, Chris. That was uh, fantastic. Thank you for being here today. Uh, on behalf of all of our uh, listeners and the Belly Funds, uh, again, thank you uh, for your participation. We'll see you in New York soon, Mac. Likewise. Thank you. Take care.